Good morning. morning. If you'd all be pleased to stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be speaking today on the topic of the commands of kingdom love. The commands of kingdom love. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, verse 28. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you take this sermon and impress it upon our hearts. Give us a complete and free movement of the Holy Spirit this day. Bind Satan, our enemy, that this word be free to touch, challenge, encourage, and change each heart. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The text we're looking at today draws our attention again to the Sermon on the Mount that we began preaching on last week. And it needs to be known that, as I mentioned last week, there is a more full full, uh, exposition of this sermon that's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And textual variations that you see between Luke's gospel and the gospel of Matthew can be explained that way. Put it this way. When Jesus was preaching, he didn't preach for 10 minutes. We're fairly sure of that. If you were to read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 you would see it would take between 8 and 10 minutes to read that. If you read Luke's account, it takes between 2 and 3 minutes. And we're pretty confident Jesus probably preached at least an hour, right? One of the most important things we have to recognize about this sermon is that it is about life in the kingdom of Christ as contrasted to life outside the kingdom of Christ. So Jesus reveals the principles of the kingdom as opposed to the principles that are not of the kingdom. What we're really looking at here is the life of believers is contrasted to the life of unbelievers. In fact, Jesus opened this sermon that way. Back in verse 20, when we taught this last week, he opens the sermon with, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. That is the topic, the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew chapter Uh, 5 verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's important that we recognize that. Because those who are blessed are in the kingdom of heaven. And as we uh, spoke last week, they are those who are poor in spirit, meaning they have the understanding that without Christ, They are spiritual paupers. Spiritual paupers. Those who are blessed are in the kingdom of God. They are those who recognize themselves to be poor, spiritually poor, hungry, weeping, and alienated sinners. They know their need of salvation. They know their need of the Savior. And friends, this is the consistent message of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament as well. It's written for the purpose 
that people can know that they are truly in the kingdom. Those who are redeemed are hungry for a righteousness they do not have. They recognize their spiritual brokenness. And once they identify with the true and living God, they're no longer alienated from God, they're alienated from the world. We're going to talk more about that today. So the first way you can tell a Christian is by how he views himself. A desperate, empty, helpless, hopeless sinner saved by grace. But that is not how many who were in the crowd that Jesus spoke to that day viewed themselves. Many that he spoke to that day viewed themselves very differently. We're going to get into that more later. But for now, I want everybody to consider with me the reasons Jesus is teaching this sermon. He's dealing with a group of people who were known for their self-righteousness. Self-righteous people do not see themselves as being in need of the Savior. So they don't cry out for mercy from God. In their opinion, they see themselves as having plenty of merit through which they can receive God's favor. Self-righteous people believe they are moral enough and that they have achieved enough to make it into the kingdom of God. And those who are self-righteous look down on other people that they see are less righteous than they are. Self-righteous people are often referred to as religious people. And the Jewish people in the days of Christ were what we would say very religious. Theirs was a works-based system of belief, just like many who live today. So be it known, Jesus draws the distinction between those who are lost and those who are saved by designating the unsaved as those who believe themselves to be rich, full, joyous, and popular. Verses 24, 25, and 26 that we taught last week. When in reality, they do not know their eternity will be a time of perpetual emptiness, weeping, an alienation from God and eternal hell. Those woes are pronounced upon the unsaved. So now we turn from that, the beatitudes, the blessings, and the woes upon the unsaved, and Jesus turns our attention to what kind of life must be lived in order to show that there has been a response to what Jesus has just taught. In other words, believers are to live lives that reveal they have taken to heart the warnings that Christ gave in verse 24, 25, and 26. So look with me now at verse 27, 28. But I say unto you which here love your enemies... Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. I want to make something real clear here. Out of all of the crowd that's gathered when Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, I hope you see that now he is narrowing this crowd down to those who hear. And I hope you recognize what that means. An unbeliever does not have the capacity to hear God. 
many unbelievers in the crowd that day. But some believed on Christ. Let me say this again. I'm going to drive this point home. An unbeliever does not have the capacity to hear God or to respond to God. 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 literally says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And not only does Jesus narrow his audience down to those who believe, but he narrows it down even further to those who are believe, are believing in him and facing persecution because of their relationship with him. So what he's about to say is the believers are not only known by the hatred of their own personal sin, but they're known by the love they have for those who hate them. They love their enemies. In Judaism, I'm just going to say this quite frankly, loving one's neighbor eventually came down to mean to love only those who have a similar religious thinking than you, uh, with you. In other words, love those who believe the way you believe. You don't love those who are opposed and hostile. And we're going to see as we continue through this sermon, it's easy to love those who are favorable to us, isn't it? Very easy. But to love those who are in opposition is a different matter. Now, it must be known, the enemies spoken here are those who oppose Christians because they follow Jesus and in context, he is speaking with regard to those mentioned in Luke 6, verse 22. And he's talking about religious hatred and persecution directed toward those who follow Christ. And he just comes right out and says, we are to love those who hate us. This is very contrary to human thinking, is it not? Luke 6.22 sets the context here. Blessed are you, get this, when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and when they revile you, and when they cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. That blessing comes with a command to follow the dictates of Christ by loving those who hate us. The mark of a true believer, Brother Roger, is love. To love God, to love fellow believers, and to love unbelievers. Even those who hate us because we follow Jesus. And I will admit, this is not an ordinary love. It's difficult. It's a superior love. But I want everyone to recognize with me as well that this is a love that is appropriate for those who have experienced God's forgiveness. Note, we are not to love the evil, satanic world system that unbelievers belong to. But we must love the lost. And you would say why they are our mission field. They need the Lord. They need to be loved. And this calls for supernatural love. 
So, true believers are not only known by the repugnance of personal sin, but they're known by how they view others. And since they're not self-righteous, and they know that they are merely sinners saved by God's grace, they will look upon unsaved people with compassion because they need to be saved. This includes even those people who hate them. Because they know that the only way of salvation for others is the same way of salvation they received. We acknowledge by the word of God, Ephesians 2.8, that believers are sinners saved by grace through faith. And we also acknowledge Romans 10.17, that that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we know that those in need of salvation need to hear the word of God in order to be saved. And we who believe in Christ have been commissioned to carry the message. Amen? Jesus says, you can tell a true disciple of Christ by how they view other people, especially those who are lost, those who are their enemies. Now, I want to deviate just a moment from what we're teaching here, and I want to talk about some popular reactions to this teaching, because I feel maybe I need to lighten things up just a bit. There are those who find this command to be a good reason for isolating themselves. And here are some examples of how that pattern of thinking works. They may say, well, I already feel bad enough about myself. My esteem is already severely battered. So why should I stoop to bother to love those who will only bring me further down. They may say, well, since they already hate me, why bother? Let them think what they want to think, who cares? Or they may think, I'll just crawl into my own self-pity and I'll stay away from those who persecute and hate me because after all, like they said, I'm a miserable wretch anyway. Or, if I minister to those who hate me, they'll end up being a bad influence on me, so what's the point? I think the best thing perhaps I can do is go check myself into a monastery somewhere where I can be alone. Now that really happens, you're falling into the trap of Satan. Because these people need Christ. So, we are called to love the lost. And the question comes, how can we take the gospel to those who need to be saved if we do not go out to them? As the Apostle Paul relates this question in Romans 10, 14, how are they going to hear without someone who doesn't preach? And that's not talking about pastors. It's talking about the proclamation of the Word of God. And Paul asks the following question, how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can they have a preacher unless somebody goes. So our relation is to be characterized by love. And what Jesus is teaching is something that I know is very difficult for many to get their hands around. Very difficult. We are called not only to accept animosity, 
but to respond to animosity with love. Now, admittedly, there are those who believe that the righteous thing to do is retaliate, but Jesus teaches us to do that which is not normal. Christians recognize themselves to be sinners saved by grace, but by no means is a Christian normal. And you would say, well, how is a Christian not normal? Because Christ isn't normal. And since we're Christian, that means we're followers of Christ, who is not normal, and so we're weird. (laughs) To unbelievers, vengeance is strength. But loving the enemy is not normal. And I want you to know that the crowd that was out there listening to Jesus the day he preached this Sermon on the Mount, this crowd from Israel, was like many today. It was not normal to love your enemy. What had happened in Israel is very important to know. Because from the true faith that God gave the Jewish people, over the process of time, there had developed a Judaism that was based partly on Old Testament, partly upon rabbinic tradition, teaching the rabbis, and partly simply out of human invention, Judaism had become an apostate faith. And in their belief system, it was a sin to love your enemy. So when Jesus stepped in front of the crowd, he's got many opponents who hear him say, love your enemies. But you have to understand as well that most of them could not understand why he would say such a thing. To the Jews of that day, as well as many people of today, this statement, love your enemies, is immoral and it's offensive. Because spiritual virtue seems to be somehow tied to hatred. Now, some things we also know about the Jewish people, much of their animosity was directed toward the Romans. They resented the Roman occupation of Israel. They resented the loss of their own sovereign government. They hated the Romans for placing the Herodian dynasty, to be their direct rulers under Rome. The Herod family was Idumean. They weren't Jewish. They hated Caesar. You know, the Roman legions would come into those areas with poles carrying flags of Caesar. And they saw that as idolatrous. Well, the truth is, the Romans were idolaters. They were unbelievers. Every time they saw a Roman coin with Caesar stamped on it, they hated. They hated so much, they even had a clandestine group of Jewish terrorists who went around and murdered Romans. They not only hated in those ways, but over time they even came to the point where they learned to hate those who violated God's law. And they believed that this hatred was the righteous thing to do. And they are not unlike some people today, 
who believe incorrectly that it is their responsibility to hate anyone who does not agree with them. Hate cult members. Hate those who corrupt God's law. Hate those who diminish the name of God. Hate those who sin in any other way. But people need Christ. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. And it's just as crucial a message for us today as it was for them. Hate seems to have become a virtue in our day. Think about it. Hate Christians. Hate those who hate Christians. Hate those who revile God. Hate liberals. Hate the conservatives. But here comes Jesus and says, love your enemies. Pray for them. Do good to them. Bless them. And to most people, this is entirely unacceptable. Then again, everything Jesus taught was unacceptable to the people. You know, we studied previously in Luke 4 about how Jesus went into the synagogue in Nazareth Nazareth, where he lived 30 years of his life. He went into the synagogue he grew up in, where everybody knew him. And he preached one message, and they wanted to throw him off the cliff. Because they couldn't accept what he had to say. After one sermon... And because everything he said was opposite of what they'd come to believe. So Jesus says the believers are persecuted for the cause of Christ. And they will have people who hate them because they're followers of Christ. But he commands his followers to love their enemies. They are to hate their own sin, but view other sinners with love. And this is important to understand, because in this section of Scripture, there are four commands that are given. Commands to love with a kingdom type of love. Verse 27, By saying to you which here, love your enemies. There are no loopholes here. You can look for them everywhere, there's none. This is a command to love your enemies. And I want you to notice something. Jesus totally stuns the religious group. They're blasted out of their mind. Drop down with me to verse 32 and 33. We're going to be teaching on this in the future, but I need to refer to it right now. In Luke 6, verse 32 and 33, Jesus says, But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? That's a good question. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Jesus again draws the line between those who are saved and those who are not. Now, again, I want to re reinforce this in our understanding. Jesus does not teach that we are to approve of the evil that is perpetrated by our enemies. And nowhere does Jesus reject law and justice. But we must love. And we must love because we follow Jesus, and he loves in the Bible, love and hate are intrinsically connected with the gospel. Christ warned that the world would hate those who follow him. Luke chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. 
Because sinners love darkness rather than light. John 3.19 And believers are children of light. Ephesians 5.8 Who represent Jesus Christ as the light of the world. John 8.12 so they can be expected to be hated by the world because they're not of the world. John 14. Just as Jesus is not of the world. John 17, 16. Now regarding the crowd that came to see Jesus that day, here are some important observations. There was a group in Judaism known as the Essenes. And they considered themselves to be the most devout of all Jewish people. In their writings, they wrote the following. Love all that God has chosen and hate all that he has rejected. Love the sons of light and hate the sons of darkness. You know what they just said? Hate unbelievers. In fact, they actually went so far as to hate anyone who was not an Essene, who was not a part of their group. Consider the Pharisees and their writings. They write, if a Jew sees a Gentile fallen into the sea, let him by no means lift him out of there. And you would ask the question, why? Because he is not your neighbor... Therefore, let him drown. He is a Gentile. So because he's one of those pagan Gentiles, don't even bother to lift him out of the water. Don't rescue a Gentile. Now this had become a part of their religious virtue. They were taught this. We also know from Roman authors in that day that the Jews were known for their hatred for those who are not Jewish. What an awful testimony. Hate everyone. And friends, some of the most intense hatred comes from religious people. Hear me well. Some of the most intense hatred comes from religious people because they have an illusion, a false illusion, a virtue in grandeur with God. But Christians are known by their love. Now, in Deuteronomy 23, the Bible tells us how it is God's prerogative to exercise judgment upon sinners. But somehow or another, over time, the Jewish people had concluded that God had granted them the right of vengeance. So because also God had at times used Israel as an instrument of judgment upon others, they thought that that right had been bequeathed to them. They also learned to pray the imprecatory psalms that prayed devastation and destruction upon their enemies. But they totally overlooked Deuteronomy 32:35, "Vengeance is mine," says the Lord. "I will repay." Now here is a small glimpse of what scripture does teach. If you turn with me to Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. 
where it is taught by the Lord. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Notice this is not a suggestion. This is a command. Hear the words of Job. 31, verse 29 and 30. I'll wait till you turn there. Job 31, verse 29 and 30. Where Job says, If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil found him, but indeed I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. Job would never even consider invoking a curse upon his enemies. Romans 12, verse 17 and 18. Romans 12, verse 17 and 18. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Scripture clearly teaches that we are responsible for our side of the ledger, regardless what the other person has done. Proverbs twenty five twenty one. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I want to say something. The big question in Judaism then, and in today's society now, was who is my neighbor? And you know, Jesus went out of his way to teach in Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37, who our neighbor is by the use of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Whoever is lying in the street and needs help is our neighbor. But if you were an Essene, part of the Essene community, your neighbor could only be an Essene, no one else. If you were a Pharisee, your neighbor could only be a Pharisee. Jesus teaches that your neighbor is whoever comes across your path, even our enemies, because our enemies need the gospel of Christ. They need the love of Christ. Everything that Jesus taught is contrary to what people think and what they want to believe. We are not to allow evil to overwhelm us. Back in Luke chapter 6, again, I'll be teaching on this when we get to it, but I have to refer to it today in this sermon. Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and 36. Jesus says, But love ye your enemies, and do good and even lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward should be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. What's he saying? We're to overwhelm the evil person by responding with goodness. Isn't that what Christ did? 
Notice the next part in verse 27. Do good to them which hate you. Love must always have an action tied to it. And where to love is Jesus loves. When it says here to do good, it's a translation of the Greek word kalos, and it means not that which is superficially good. Like saying, oh, uh, your hair looks nice. Or those clothes look good on you. It has to do with what is beneficial for the other person. And in context, he's referring to those who hate us. What is beneficial for the one who hates you? This is an act of love. And I want to make this really clear. Because this, this is very, very important. Christians must reinforce the supernatural message of the gospel with a supernatural love. Because the credibility of the gospel is at stake. You would say, how? How did Jesus save lost sinners? By love. When the gospel is lived out in life, it is powerful. It is powerful. The gospel is proven true when believers love those who hate them. We must never forget Romans 5.10. God loved us when we were yet enemies with him. When we love like that, we follow the teaching of the Apostle Paul in Romans 12.21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus overcame evil with good. And we're to do the same. We must also remember 1 Peter 3, 9. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And doing good to those who hate us, we must seek to do that which can lead to to their salvation. Find every possible means to do good unto them. Good overcomes evil. We're to act in their best interest. Sounds easy, doesn't it? This is the supernatural love, folks. And it comes from a relationship with supernatural God. Verse 28, bless them that curse you. Instead of cursing our enemies as they have cursed us, it says bless them. This refers to how we speak. So it's not only about how we feel and act toward unbelievers, but also how we speak to them. Part of the blessing of those who curse you is to invoke God's favor on behalf of that person. To appeal to God. And about that I can say this much. We bless our enemies by following the Holy Spirit of God, not our flesh. Now, the Jews... They followed a very popular but unbiblical teaching. Matthew 5.43, in Matthew's text of this same sermon, Jesus says, You have heard that it hath been said. I want you to notice something peculiar about that. He didn't say that it had been written Because it wasn't ever written. When he says, you have heard that it hath been said, he's referring to rabbinical tradition. 
things they had been taught erroneously because they're separate from the authoritative Word of God. You have heard that it has been said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what the Jews in Jesus' day had been taught. But it's not what God taught. Jesus says, bless them that curse you. How are other ways that we can bless those who curse us? Share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, if at all possible. The greatest blessing on anyone is to get right with God. To bless those that curse you is important because Christ gave his life to overcome evil and he did it out of love. And so our attitude towards others involves how we feel about them, how we act toward them, how we speak to them, and also this next one is about how we appeal to God for them. Verse 28, And pray for them which despitefully use you. I want you to know that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, the Apostle Peter, picking up on this teaching of Christ that we're going through, he said, pray for kings emperors, governors, those who are in authority over you. Pray for them. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. Pray for them, even though they hate you. Pray for them. What should we pray? Now, I want to tell you what most people would pray. Because I want to relate uh, some very important truths. Most people, when confronted by persecutors and those hate them, just want to pray, God, could you please send Jesus back today? <laughs> now, I knew a man that every time that I saw him, that's what he'd say. And I would always come back to him and say, do you recognize that by praying that, how many people are damned to hell? Do I want to see Christ return? Oh, please. <laughs> but what about those who are lost? What about those who are lost? There are those who would say, God, please send Jesus back today, put an end to sin, put an end to all those who hate me and persecute me, eradicate sin from this world, and let's go. And I can't argue with that. Except, what about praying, God, there's this person who hates you, hates the gospel, and they hate me too. Lord, please save that person from hell. I want us all to recognize this is the prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross of Calvary. Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. The Son of God, pray to God the Father that God would forgive the sin of ignorance. In Acts chapter 7, verse 60, Stephen, that faithful martyr of Christ, followed suit. And when they were stoning him to death, he said, Lord, 
Lay not this sin to their charge. He said, Father, forgive them. A prayer for his enemies. These are the commands of kingdom love. And I want to say this. Intercession to God for those who hate us and persecute us is one of the highest forms of love. It is a supernatural love that requires that we reverse all of our natural instincts. Amen. It is a love that can only come through complete submission and dependence upon God through salvation in Jesus Christ. Christians are known by two things. How they hate their own personal sin and how they love other sinners and want to see them get right with God. Loving our enemies is the command. That is what impacts the world for Christ. To love as Christ loves. With every head bowed, with every eye closed. To love our enemies is to know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave himself on the cross while we were his enemies. Jesus teaches these principles so that the hearers can know whether or not they're truly in the kingdom of God. Father in heaven, please lead us when we are in the presence of our enemies. Lead us with the same grace that you gave us when we were your enemies. Use us, Lord, to bring the lost to Christ through the power of divine love. For that we pray in Christ's name. Amen.